science friends. Um, today we are going to talk about something called linked genes. Okay. Now this is different. Do not get this confused with sex linked genes. That's what we talked about last class. That's what you all did the Punnett squares on um, with X and Y when you had to draw your little letters as superscript. Those are genes on the sex chromosomes. Okay. These linked genes um, are, for the most part, going to be on the autosomes. Remember, autosomes are non-sex chromosomes. The first in humans, the first 22 um, pair, not that last sex chromosome pair. So, linked genes are going to be genes that are located together on the same chromosome. So, if we draw a chromosome, it's going to look something like this, right? And so, you've got lots of genes on that chromosome, I'm going to just label these here, A, B, um, C, D, and E, okay? Those are the genes that are on this chromosome. Um, linked genes are genes that are located on um, the same chromosome. Any genes that are located on the same chromosome that tend to be inherited together are called linked genes, okay? Now, the closer genes are the more linked they are. And the more likely they are to be inherited together. So I want you to think about it this way. The closer genes are, the more linked they are, and the more likely they are to be inherited together. If we were going to take your whole grade, the entire junior class, and we were going to separate you into groups alphabetically, I'm not telling you how many groups you're going to be in, but we're going to separate you alphabetically by last name. What is the likelihood that Wesley Cares and Alex Shimura with a C would be in the same group? Pretty likely, right? Because they are both in that C group, CA and CH. It's very likely that they're going to be inherited together, um, sorry, not inherited together, that they're going to be grouped together, okay? What about, I'm not sure I understand. sorry, that was my watch. What about Wesley Cares and Jabel Smith, okay? Probably not going to be too many groupings where the C's and the S's are going to be inherited together if you're grouped alphabetically. Okay, so we would say that Wesley Cares and Alex Shimura would be more likely to be inherited together. If those were genes, because they are close together, they're going to be more likely to inherited together. Now, let's think about Jenna Morrow and the other Jenna Morrow. There's another Jenna Morrow in your, in your grade that's not in our class. I think they're Jenna G and Jenna K. Um, I don't even know which one we have. Um, but anyway, I think we have Jenna G, but I could be wrong on that. They're even more closely together than Wesley and Alex are, right? Because they're like the same name. They're one initial apart. So if we're separating by last name, it's super likely that they're going to be inherited together, right? That they're going to be in the same group together. And that's kind of how genes are as well, okay? I'm going to draw one more gene on my chromosome here. So if you were looking at this chromosome, which two genes are most likely going to be inherited together? You would probably say E and F because they are drawn most closely together, okay? The ones that are least likely to be inherited together would be A and F because they are very far apart, okay? So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about linked genes. So this is another Thomas Hunt Morgan experiment Something he realized um, when he was studying those fruit flies, that Drosophila melanogaster fruit fly. So what he did in his parent or his pea generation, he had two fruit flies. Um, one that was the wild type. Remember, wild type just remember, means that they have um, kind of the most common trait. Um, so they were homozygous gray body and normal wings. The little plus indicates that that's the wild type trait. This little plus here, um, that's the wild type. Versus over here, you have the mutant. 
So black body and vestigial wings are a double mutant. They don't have either of the wild type gray or normal trait. So they have black body vestigial wings. And so when we cross those, all of your offspring would have this genotype. Big B plus from the wild type parent, little b from the um, mutant parent, VG plus from the wild type parent, and VG from the mutant parent. Okay, so 100% of the offspring would look like this. All right, so then they took those females and they did a test cross with the males that were all a double mutant. So all of your females had this genotype. All of your males had that double mutant um, like this one here. And so what would we expect if we looked at this? We would expect... Um, if you, you know, if you foiled this and you did the Punnett square, this is the Punnett square here that we would get if you did those two parents um, from that F1 generation, we would expect 25%, 25%, 25%, 25%, 25%, 25%, 25%, okay? But that's not what Thomas Hunt Morgan got. Instead, he got 965 of these, 944 of these. Um, 206 of these and 185 of these, okay? Definitely not what we expected, okay? That's more like a 75%, 25% ratio instead of a 25, 25, 25, 25 or a 1 to 1 to 1 ratio, okay? So, what's up? Well, it's because these genes are linked, okay? Notice here in the offspring, um, he doesn't show a difference in males or females here. Now, he did in the parents. He told us that the females were this and the males were this. But in this offspring, he doesn't tell us any difference in the males and females. So that tells us it's not a sex-linked gene, okay? Um, but it is a linked gene. And so if it were non-linked genes, we would expect this 25, 25, 25, 25 ratio, okay? That's what the law of independent assortment tells us, that those chromosomes would split apart randomly. But because these genes are linked, because the genes for the body type, the black body versus the gray body, and the wing type, the normal um, wing versus the vestigial wings, vestigial wings just means a really small wing. Because those two are close together on the same chromosome, it's more likely that they would be inherited together rather than be inherited separately, okay? And so the ones that were the biggest, if you notice, they're the same as the parents. The double mutant, the black vestigial, and um, the wild type, the gray normal. And so these two have what we call the parental phenotype. These other two have what we call the recombinant phenotype, okay? And we'll come to these terms in just a second. And so this process is called genetic recombination. The, pro the production of offspring with combinations of traits different from those found in either parent, okay? That's called genetic recombination. These two are recombinants. They don't have the trait of either parent. They have something different, okay? So, the parental types, they have a phenotype that matches the parent. The recombinants have a new combination um, of phenotypes that doesn't match the parents, okay? Let's look at another example with Mendel's piece. Um, if you had a yellow round offspring, or a, I'm sorry, a yellow round parent, heterozygous, and a green wrinkled parent, okay? What we would expect is 25%, 25%, 25%, 25%, just like what's shown in this modified Punnett square. But that's not what Mendel got, okay? He got about a 75% um, of those and roughly 25% of these. These are called the recombinants. These are called the parents. 
they show the same trait as the parents, yellow and round or green and wrinkled. These show yellow and wrinkled or green and round, which is not like either of the parents, okay? Parental types, recombinant types, all right? So what happens that causes these genes to be either inherited together or inherited apart is crossing over, okay? So when we were talking about our list of names, it's very unlikely that Jenna and Jenna Morrow are going to be separated by a crossover because they're so close together. It's unlikely that Alex and Wesley will, though more likely than Jenna and Jenna. And it's very likely that Wesley and Jabel would be separated by a crossing over because they're so far apart. So that's what separates these genes is a crossover. That's where we get the recombination of linked genes, okay? These genes that coded for the wing type and the wing color were very close together on the chromosome, okay? Type and color. They're very close together. And so it was very unlikely that crossing over happened in that very small space. Sometimes it did. About 25% of the time it did. Oh, I can't get to my picture there. Well, about 25% of the time it did, and we got these recombinant genotypes. But most of the time it didn't. And so we got these parental phenotypes. Okay, so crossing over is what gives us recombination in linked genes. And so we can look at this crossing over data and we can make what's called a genetic map. And so a genetic map just shows you a list of the genes on the chromosome and it gives you the distances of how far apart they are. Okay, um, now it doesn't really tell you... Um, it just, it just gives the distances by this recombination frequency, okay? And so they expect, expect the, uh, express these distances in a unit called MAP units. Um, sometimes they're referred to centimorgans, named after Thomas Hunt Morgan. But one MAP unit or one centimorgan is equivalent to 1% recombination rate. So if these crossed over 9.5% of the time, between VG and CN, we would say that they have, there's nine and a half map units between those on the chromosome, okay? So, it doesn't show us a precise location, like we can't say it's, you know, where it is along the DNA, but we just know relatively how close they are together, okay? We just know relatively how close they are together, not exactly where they are, all right? So, you are going to work on an assignment today um, with map units and gene linkage. So, you should have a paper in your binder that looks like this. If you do not have this paper, now that I say that, I can't promise that I put it, um, in, that I'd given it to you yet. So, if you do not have this paper, I will link it up on Google Classroom um, so that you can download it. If you are unable to print it, that's totally fine. Just make this um, chart here on a sheet of notebook paper and answer the three questions on a sheet of notebook paper. I think you have it in your binder, but I could be telling a fib. So you're going to use these images. They have already been linked to Google Classroom right here. They're called Sordaria images. And so in the Sordaria, you have to count 50 of these. Now, when you're counting them, you're counting a row of eight little, I'm going to call them seeds, okay? Eight little seeds in a row, okay? Um, I can't draw on this screen to be able to show you like eight little seeds in a row, but you're going to count them in groups of eight. You're going to indicate whether they are a parental phenotype or a recombinant phenotype that is experienced crossing over. So, let me show you what I mean. These that have four lights and four darks or four darks and then four lights, 
those are going to be non-crossover ASCII. So these are going to give you a parental phenotype, okay? Versus down here, if you have two lights, two darks, two lights, two darks, or any of these variations, those are going to have crossover. Those are going to be a non-parental or a, re a recombinant phenotype, okay? So, when you count your ASCII, you're counting those lines of them. These are radial, so you're going to start in the middle and count a row outwards. I wish that I could draw on this page, but I can't. Um, count a line. You want to count 50 total lines. Now, if you can't get 50 in one card, slide on down to another card and count that one. There's several different cards for you to choose from here. So if that first one doesn't work well for you, count, an, count another one, okay? Um, but you have to get 50 total. And you're going to tally in these charts. When you count one that's at four darks or four lights or four lights and four darks, then put a tally here, okay? If you have one that's the two lights and the two darks, the crossover phenotypes, the recombinants, then put a tally right here, okay? Your total number counted here should be about 50. If you go over a little, that's fine. You'll just have to change your percentages to be out of 50. Um, it's going to be best, though, if you do exactly 50. And then... Recombination frequency, that's the percent of crossover. So you'll have to figure out a percent here and then divide that by two. Okay, so you'll take this number over 50 and then express that as a percent, divide it by two, and that'll give you a recombination frequency. And then that recombination frequency is actually equal to, as it tells you here, equal to the distance in map units. So those numbers should be the same. Okay. So then you're just going to answer a few questions there. Um, it's going to tell you the published data and you're going to see how your results compare to that. All right. So hopefully that wasn't too confusing. Um, I wish that I could draw on this image over here again, but start in the middle and count a row or a line outwards. They all, they're radial there. So don't just count random ones. You're counting a, a line, a long straight section of it together. There should be eight in a line, okay? If you have any questions, holler at me. If not, then you all have a great day and hopefully I will see you tomorrow.